talk showing and rotating credentials is sadly not going to happen. Instead, uh, Eric is going to talk about uh, what he may or may ha not have learned from SendMail. So um, you might want to go there. And now for our actual scheduled talk, uh, please welcome Aaron Thomas. He's going to talk about what happens when you use a flamethrower on an operating system. Welcome him. Sorry, turn on your mic. Say something. Check, check. Oh, okay. Weird. The light was on. All right, cool. Start over then. Uh, my name is Arun Thomas, and my talk is titled Rust Systems Programmers Can Have Nice Things. Thanks for coming in. It's the, still pretty early in the morning. I appreciate it. Um, so, all right, how many of you consider yourself a systems programmer? Okay, most of the room. Um, yeah, so systems programming is fun, but it's like, it's pretty painful. Um, I don't know if you've read this piece by James Mickens, but it like really resonates for me. Um, so I've like, the quotes that you can read, it says, a systems programmer has seen the terrors of the world and understood the intrinsic horror of existence. Um, and this is sort of like, what it is to be a systems programmer, right? You see a lot of like really gnarly, nasty stuff. You're looking at like hardware bugs, concurrency stuff. There's bugs at all layers of the stack. Your compiler could be broken. It's like, it's a lot of pain, right? Um, so that's just kind of the life that we lead. And, uh, but I'm wondering if maybe it doesn't have to be that way, or maybe it could be a little bit less painful. Um, so what makes system software hard? There's a few things. Uh, one, the stakes are high, so system software is critical to enforcing safety and security. It's the foundation that all the other software on the system runs on, so like, you have to make sure it works. So when I, when I say system software, I mean things like kernels, hypervisors, firmware, bootloaders, embedded software, language, language runtimes, and even browsers are, I would consider system software now. They're basically mini OSs. They're really complicated mini OSs. Um, and they're usually written in C or C++ for performance. Um, but the problem is that C and C++ are not memory safe, and as we've learned over the last few decades, uh, that causes a lot of problems. Um, so you see a lot of these memory corruption vulnerabilities, they abound, they're exploited. Um, there's a recent Microsoft study about this. Um, so Microsoft found that memory unsafety is a problem. They found that Microsoft uh, found essentially, it's uh, yeah, not a surprise, <laughs> but uh, in their products, they did a study over, I think, like from 2006 to 2018, and they found that 70% of the CVEs in their products each year continue to be memory safety issues. Um, so this was presented pretty recently at the Blue Hat conference that Microsoft organizes. 
And now all the BSD programmers are much better programmers than the ones at Microsoft, of course, and we're all 10x programmers, but still we encounter a lot of these same issues. Memory safety is a problem industry-wide, um, or memory safety bugs and memory corruption vulnerabilities. Um, so what, what can we do about it? So Microsoft had a f uh, series of posts about this, and one of the things that they are interested in exploring and announced that they're exploring is Rust. So they said, we believe Rust changes the game when it comes to writing safe system software. Rust provides the performance and control needed to write low-level systems while empowering software developers to write robust, secure programs. So there's a lot of people who are kind of getting on the kind of like Rust bandwagon for, I think, good reasons. Um, Intel also starting to invest in Rust. Um, there was a talk at the, uh, I guess it was Intel's Open Source Technology Summit. Um, there was a guy who was leading up the FFI working group to improve. Uh, so Rust actually has really good interoperability with C, but they're making sure to get rid of all the kind of like remaining issues, basically. And so this guy's leading that up. And so he gave a talk about uh, Intel's role with Rust and sort of the future of systems programming. So you see a lot of people who are interested in Rust nowadays, and basically a lot for basically because it's a it's a safe language, but it's low level enough that you can actually you know do operating systems and that kind of thing. Um, so that's kind of like the motivation, and so I'll kind of give you the quick overview of the talk. Um, so the systems programmers can have nice things. That's not me. That's a quote I got from uh, Robert O'Callaghan. He's an engineer at Mozilla, so it was in a blog post. I thought it was pretty uh, fitting. Um, so the talk has three parts. Um, first, I'll give you a quick pitch about why Rust. Um, I'll it'll be pretty high level. I'll talk about some of the features. I'll show you a little bit of the syntax, but I don't really have time to go do a deep tour of the language. But I'll give you links to resources if you want to dig in more about like the various features and kind of get up to speed. The language is, it takes a little bit of time to get up to speed with. So there was enough time in this talk. Um, the second part of the talk, I'll talk about Rust for system software. So you're starting to see more and more people applying um, Rust to building system software um, in industry and in academia. But I'll focus more on industry. Um, and then finally, I'll give you a quick, uh, like, uh, quick refresher on, or like, quick uh, description of how to get up to get how to get uh, BSD, get Rust running on BSD. Um, and so, basically, it's pretty easy to do, and uh, the packages are actually <clears throat> you can actually grab Rust packages using standard package manager. So it's actually pretty easy to get up and going. Um, okay, so why Rust? Why is Rust interesting? Um, there's a lot of hype around Rust. Um, why, why should you care? Um, so first, I'll give the disclaimer. I actually like C. I think it's fun. Um, it's, uh, it's maybe it's Stockholm Syndrome. I don't know. But like, it's like you, you feel the power, right? I mean, you, you can do whatever you want. Um, but I think maybe it's not the best language for building large-scale systems now that we have other options. Um, so the thing is, like, I mean, C is great. I mean, C is, the thing about C is that it's almost 50 years old, right? Um, and it turns out programming languages have evolved a bit in the last 50 years. Um, programming languages researchers at academia have been doing things, industry people have been doing things, and maybe we should use language that's learned some of these lessons, especially when uh, you have to worry about all these vulnerabilities and security is much more, uh, much more serious problem, as is safety. And if you want to build really rock-solid systems, I feel like maybe C is not the best option. If you're building a new system, you should definitely consider safe languages like Rust. I mean, there are other options as well, um, but I think Rust is a particularly good option. Um, so I think Rust does, makes a, it's a good blend of, uh, the pitch is basically Rust is a safe, fast, productive systems programming language. And so I think the thing that it does well is it gives you a lot of the high level, the productivity of high level, high level languages and the safety of high level languages, but also uh, it has the performance of like C or C++. Um, so it kind of blends the productivity of a high level language with the really like low level control and the performance that you need for something like operating system kernels and language runtimes and things like that. Um, so where does Rust come from? So Mozilla Research originally created the language. Um, they, uh, their initial use case was they were creating this new experimental browser engine. So they wanted to do something. They wanted to start over. Um, basically, they had Firefox, which um, and I mean, Firefox is a good browser, but they wanted to see if they could push it farther, especially on like multi-cores and new architectures, looking more reliable architecture. So they were building this new browser engine, and they sort of at the same time were co-designing a new language to design this browser engine in. Um, so over time, the language matured. Um, it's been, I guess, 1.0 was four years ago, and then uh, in 2016, they actually started uh, taking some of these components <coughs> from Servo that were written in Rust, um, and they actually started shipping them in Firefox. Um, so uh, Mozilla has a cute term for this process of converting 
uh, Firefox into like Rust components. It's called oxidization, which I thought was cool. Um, and they've kind of been focusing on the pieces of Firefox that will either improve security or performance. So one of the things they looked at is uh, they replaced their MP4 metadata parser. So this is a this is lib stage fright. It was there was a big vulnerability in Android previously. It's a pretty buggy thing to do, and so by getting rid of this uh, vulnerable parser, they were able to make Firefox substantially safer, at least for this particular attack vector. Um, and then for performance, they uh, they they basically use this. Uh, they uh, they brought over the Stylo parallel CSS engine, and using Rust concurrency primitives, they were able to. Uh, substantially uh, speed up page loads, I think by like 70% or something like that. It was, it was fairly substantial depending on how many cores you have, but it seemed to parallelize well. So Rust has been having pretty good experience like uh, applying Rust to these sorts of systems problems. And so they're going through this process of like over time upgrading uh, Firefox to use more and more Rust components, really focusing on the security critical and performance critical pieces of the, uh, the stack. Um, so the kind of overall pitch for Rust is that its performance is on par with C. Uh, you have memory safety without garbage collection overheads, which is kind of an interesting trade-off. So typically with safe languages, you're, you have to deal with the overheads of garbage collection, or you have to deal with like a mandatory runtime, and that's not really ideal for low-level systems software, especially if you're doing like deeply embedded kinds of things. Um, the other thing that Rust has um, is thread safety, data race freedom, what they call fearless concurrency. And so there's no concurrency bugs associated with multi-threaded code. And the way they do this is they basically have a sophisticated type system that tracks ownership, and it enforces the memory and thread safety properties um, at, statically at compile time. Um, so in addition, it's a fairly productive language. Um, if you're doing systems programming, you need good inter interoperability, interoperability with C. Um, this is, there's a lot of C software that's out there, so you need to make sure that the Rust code interoperates with it. Um, and it also number, has a number of fancy language features um, that you know, gets programming languages people excited. Um, things like type inference, which also is just generally useful, algebraic data types, pattern matching, traits, generics. If you're familiar with Go, this is kind of like interfaces, sort of um, more for Haskell, it's kind of like type classes and things like that, if you're familiar with Haskell or OCaml. Um, it also has modules, hygienic macros, so um, Instead of using CPP, it actually has macros that are actually the compiler can check and make sure you don't do anything uh, too crazy. And uh, it has like little niceties like handy literals. You've got binary literals. You can have literals where you have underscores, which makes the uh, literals much more readable. So it's uh, it's kind of a they've they've done a lot of these things that make it nice to use. Um, there's also really great tooling and developer environment in general. Um, so. The compiler um, has, is pretty friendly and has useful error messages. Often it'll tell you, well, it'll tell you how to fix things. I mean, so the, uh, the ownership model requires some getting used to, um, but the compiler errors are generally useful in that they tell you usually how to fix the thing. But you do have to get your, I'll talk about the ownership model a little bit later. Um, so Cargo, I think, is a great package manager. So it's pretty nice to have like a systems language where you can easily have something that brings in packages, manages all the dependencies for you. You don't have to deal with like, the, I don't know, a crazy CMake setup or anything like that. So I think Cargo is actually really nice um, and is one of the big advantages of using Rust for systems programming. Um, and then like Rust format I think is great too. Um, you don't have to bike shed over coding styles. There's just one coding style and the tool will enforce it. So um, other languages have this like Go and things like that. So I, I like that a lot. Um, so I'm going to kind of quickly go over a few snippets of what Rust looks like. I don't really have time to go into the language in detail, but uh, this is what a hello world looks like. So fn is how you declare a function, and then you got main, and then println is how you print something. And so the, the bang, the exclamation point, um, indicates that this is a macro. Um, so this is actually using a lot of the kind of like calls like this, the system call, or the kind of like uh, utilities are actually macros. So they're actually, unlike see these are actually safe things. Um, so here's a quick example of factorial. Um, it looks you know, kind of like C-ish, except you know, the, uh, the arguments are a little bit different. There's fewer parentheses, so the return argument is on the right. Um, it looks a little bit like Go if you've used it. Um, so, but yeah, so this is kind of a standard factorial thing. Um, so 
one difference is if, when you, if you want to declare variables is how you declare them. Um, by default, they're immutable. So when you do let x equals 2, that's an immutable uh, variable. So if you try to change it, then you get an error. So the compiler will complain. Um, if you want to make a, a mutable variable, you actually have to specify, you have to use the mutable keyword. So you say let mute x equals 2. Then you can actually modify it. So then you can increment it and print it. So that's what happens here. So uh, by default, um, variables are immutable. Um, references are kind of how you do pointers in Rust. Um, so this is how you declare a vector um, of, so one, two, three. Um, the ampersand is how you get a reference, and so it's essentially a pointer to the same uh, data structure. And the, uh, it takes some getting used to the rules for how to do the, what, what Rust calls this is a borrow. And so the understanding the sort of type system and how borrows work is a little bit complicated and is one of the uh, things that you'll have to get used to if you get into Rust stuff. Um, so one of the things that happens, um, a lot of what Rust does is uh, you get into the, this process where you're uh, trying to make sure that you can satisfy the, uh, the invariance that Rust is trying to guarantee. And one of the things that it tries to make sure is that there's only one mutable reference in a given scope. Um, this is important for data race freedom. So in this example, you have a mutable string. Um, and then you basically have a couple immutable references. That's fine. But then when in R3, if, I don't know if you can see that, but uh, there's another mutable reference. And since you have two mutable references at the same time, the compiler gives you an error that gets checked statically. Um, so it sort of gives you the kind of flavor of uh, sort of what the memory, like sort of what references and um, what the syntax looks like a little bit. So this part is actually one of the, one of the pieces of the language that uh, is, it's fairly innovative. It's where a lot of the uh, kind of interesting guarantees of Rust come from, but also takes some getting used to. So um, it's powerful, but it takes some time to fully grok. Um, so there's some simple rules. What the compiler does essentially is it'll track the ownership and borrowing and use. Um, and essentially it does this to determine object lifetimes and restrict mutation of state. So the way these uh, references work is uh, you want to make, the compiler basically will allow you to do mutation or allow sharing. So you can't uh, modify shared mutable state because then you'd have a, you could potentially have a data race. Um, so the rules at, at a high level are each value has a single, single variable that's the owner of that variable. Um, and you can only have one owner at a time. And when the owner goes out of, scale, out of scope, the value will be dropped. Um, so the, the rules here seem fairly simple, um, but sort of like applying it to code requires practice. Um, and I won't go into it in very great detail, but uh, this, this model does have a fair amount of power because this is where you get a lot of safety. So by following these rules, you can get memory safety and thread safety. Um, but if you want to get into it a bit more deeply, uh, there's a good chapter in the, uh, the Rust book and also the, uh, the, per, the kind of the canonical, the, the free Rust book that's online and also the programming Rust book. Both, has, both have good chapters on this. Um, so now I'll talk about, uh, so that's kind of a really quick description of like Rust. I didn't really get into a lot of the advanced features, but uh, I'll give you references for digging more into that. So now I'll talk more about uh, how Rust is being used for system software. So there's been increasing use for uh, various system software use cases. Um, so there's several operating systems that are being written in uh, Rust. So a lot of them are sort of, you know, OS, de OS dev-like like projects. So basically hobbyists writing operating systems. But there's a couple ones that are particularly interesting. I think Talk is, a, is an OS for microcontrollers. It was originally a research project from, uh, I think it was Stanford, Princeton, and Michigan. Um, so they're looking at building a microcontroller OS for really deeply embedded systems where you actually care about trust and you have um, mutually <coughs> distrusting components. And uh, they, they were able to get multi-programming running in 64K of memory, which I thought was pretty cool. So if you want to read up more on this, this paper in SOSP 17 was pretty interesting. Um, there's also, if you're into like OS dev-like things, like kind of like small operating systems, there's Redox. They're kind of re-implementing a clean slate Rust kernel. And then there's this guy, uh, I think Philip Opperman, he's writing a blog series on how to write an OS in Rust, and that's kind of cool if you're interested in digging into that. Um, so there's a number of people doing hypervisors in Rust now. So Google, Amazon, and Intel are developing Rust-based hypervisors. Um, so there's the Chromium uh, cross VM hypervisor, and then that's from Google. And then Firecracker is from Amazon. They forked cross VM. 
and they kind of change some things to meet their design case, meet some of their uh, design considerations, and they're now deploying it as a micro VM in AWS, and then Intel is developing this cloud hypervisor thing. Um, so they were all kind of using similar code and kind of forking off each other. And so recently, or I guess in the last few months, they've gotten together and there's this Rust VMM initiative to kind of cre increase sharing collaboration between the three hypervisors. So it's, a, it's kind of cool that there's like three different groups working on hypervisors. Um, I think also Red Hat is involved in this and a couple other people. So it seems like a pretty in interesting initiative. Um, so this thing I thought was particularly cool. So I was at the RISC-V workshop, and I was giving a Rust talk there about uh, Rust support uh, on RISC-V. Um, and one of the core boot developers came up to me and said, hey, we're, uh, we're trying to rewrite core boot in Rust. And I was like, whoa, that's pretty cool. So they, they, I like the name. So they named it Orboot. So it's core boot with C removed. So I thought that was kind of clever. Um, and so they gave a talk at the open source firmware conference like a month ago or so. And uh, basically, they, they got it working, and apparently they're pretty happy with like the performance and how it's going. Um, they they don't have any C in there; it's just Rust and some assembly. So um, it's pretty it's pretty cool. Um, and they have initial support for Risk Five, which is pretty exciting. Um, so Microsoft is using Rust, um, so they're using it for their IoT Edge device. So that is a security daemon thing that they're using Rust for. Um, Google is now using Rust for Fuchsia components. So apparently they, I don't know if there's going to be the official network stack, but they rewrote the network stack and some other OS components in there, so that's pretty interesting. Fuchsia is this next generation kernel from uh, Google. I don't know if they're actually going to end up using it, but uh, they've got a bunch of people working on it. It seems pretty interesting, especially if, you, if you're interested in microkernels and things like that. Um, Facebook has been using Rust for their uh, Libero cryptocurrency. So, you know, Rust has arrived because it's now being used for cryptocurrency. So, um, and then, uh, what's that? <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> um, and then also parts of the uh, HHVM PHP runtime, which is the runtime that runs Facebook.com, they're rewriting some parts of OCaml, a lot of the OCaml code into Rust. So you're starting to see more deployment there as well. Intel contributed to VxWorks target, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, so you can actually run Rust code in VxWorks um, if you want to do that. Mozilla and Fastly are writing WebAssembly runtimes. Um, so there's this. Uh, the Mozilla one's Wasm time, and the Fastly one's Lucid. So it's kind of cool, actually. So like WebAssembly is a thing that was originally for the browser, so you can run native code in the browser. But now people want to run it like outside of the browser. So people are coming up with system call interfaces. This is a thing called WASI, where you can run like uh, WebAssembly on basically like anything. So it's uh, kind of an interesting initiative. It's pretty early, but it seems promising. Um, and then Cloudflare and Dropbox are using Rust for a bunch of backend services. So you see a fair amount of variety in people who are using Rust for different things, but particularly you see a lot of use cases for like kernels and uh, like embedded. Embedded seems like a particularly um, big use case. I, I would, gave a talk at a embedded Rust conference, um, and there was this guy who he uh, he programmed like a it was basically a Bluetooth controlled skateboard um, in Rust, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, he actually did a demo. It was pretty impressive. So he was just kind of like skating around the, uh, the conference room. It was good. Um, so I don't know if you saw this. Brian Cantrill gave a talk. Uh, I forget where, QCon or something. And so he's, also, he's a fan of Rust now. He's been playing around with it. And the question he asked was, is it time to rewrite the operating system in Rust? Um, and uh, so I was wondering, yeah, it seems like a good question. Is it time to rewrite uh, like BSD in Rust? Um, and so I think the answer is mostly no, uh, because there's a lot of energy invested. There's a lot of code. Um, rewriting the whole thing is just going to take too long. But I think maybe there's some use cases that uh, would be interesting to explore. Um, in particular, um, things like device drivers, um, file systems, user land utilities, network services. Um, so the core kernel, I think, is going to be difficult, like especially because BSD is a large kernel. I mean, if you're starting clean slate, you might be able to do it. I mean, there's still some uh, issues with doing a, uh, a pure Rust kernel. People have done it, but there are um, some issues. Um, but because you have this large um, kernel that already works, I think you don't want to, like, it doesn't make sense. It's like it would be too expensive to completely rewrite it. So 
I think the places where it might make sense are device drivers. Um, so the studies have shown that device drivers have three to seven times the, default, the defect rates of the rest of the kind of the core kernel. So that's a good place to look into, and file systems. Also, user land utilities, potentially, and uh, just generally um, network services, uh, bind, and all that kind of thing would be potentially useful. And on the device driver front, there's been a couple groups looking into this. There was a, a student at uh, KTH in uh, Sweden who did some work on uh, doing safe device, safe kernel programming with Rust, basically. He wrote a device driver framework for FreeBSD and Rust that was pretty interesting. And then there was a group, I think it was at TU Munich, that also did some work exploring a bunch of different languages for doing high level, like basically drivers in a bunch of different high level languages. So they had Go and Rust and a bunch of other languages that I can't remember. But they found that uh, they were able to do, get very close performance, actually. I think they were only off by like a couple percentages, a couple percentage points for the, uh, the Rust driver, at least. So they, they're pretty, um, ex they're pretty enthusiastic about Rust for this kind of thing. So it'd be cool to kind of explore this on, uh, for FreeBSD more. Um, so if you actually want to play around with Rust, um, it's fairly easy. It's already packaged up. So on FreeBSD, you can just package and install Rust. Um, and the Nightly is also packaged up. So that's actually pretty cool. So if you want to get, if you want to sort of try out the bleeding edge features, you can grab the Nightly and start playing around with it. Um, so uh, NetBSD and OpenBSD also have it packaged, as does Dragonfly. Um, the uh, sort of preferred way, or especially if you're doing, if you're managing multiple Rust tool chains, is to use Rust up. So there's support for FreeBSD and NetBSD for doing that. Um, so I think so. Rust has this thing where they have like tiers of support. So FreeBSD and NetBSD are in tier two. So like the uh, the Rust people will actually provide binary images, so you can actually grab this stuff more easily using Rust up. Um, so grabbing Rust up is pretty easy. You can do the curl sh thing. Um, the curl sh pattern is not required and probably not recommended, but uh, yeah, you can. Uh, but it's pretty easy to grab if you want to just start playing around with Rust. Um, so if you want to create a new project, I think Cargo makes it pretty easy. So there's a few commands and you can get up and running basically. So you run Cargo new. You've got uh, it creates a project for you. Um, you can specify whether you're making a binary or a library. So here I say Cargo new bin hello. Um, you can specify whether you're creating a release binary or not. In this case, I created a debug binary. Uh, you go into that directory, you run cargo run, um, it'll build it, and then you get your hello world. Um, then you can modify your source file, so like your main.c file, change it. Um, there's a file called cargo.toml that's basically how you uh, define your package dependencies. So if you want to bring in a regex package or something like that, or like um, some sort of concurrency library, you basically add it there, um, and then you run cargo run again, it'll build it, and then you get your new binary. Um, so Cargo also has a number of other features where you can, uh, you can run Cargo format, they have lints, they have a testing framework that's built in. Um, it's a pretty productive framework. Um, there's CI stuff, so it's a, it's, it's a pretty nice tool. Um, so if you want to learn more about Rust, there's a bunch of resources that are out there. Uh, the Rust programming language book is online. It's free. You can also get a, pr uh, you can also get a printed copy if you want. Um, I'm particularly fond of the uh, Programming Rust book from O'Reilly. I think it's really good. It's from uh, some Mozilla, I think some, I think Mozilla people have been around for a while. They've been doing C and C++ systems programming for a long time. Um, and then there's some like uh, courses where you can run through like, uh, they, you can run through some examples. They kind of walk you through how to get up to speed on Rust. They have this Rust by example tutorial. So there's a bunch of uh, <coughs> useful materials if you're kind of going to, if you want to get up and going. So. Um, I showed you, I mean, basically, getting, if you install Cargo, I mean, if you do the Rust up thing and you create a Cargo project, you're basically up and going, and then you can just grab one of the books and start playing around with it. I think you'll find that you can get pretty far fairly quickly. And then you'll have to learn more about uh, ownership and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, so in summary, uh, I think Rust is a fairly compelling language. Um, so you have a lot of the higher level language uh, features. Um, and the safety uh, that uh, is necessary for the kind of world that we live in where you have a lot of these uh, serious vulnerabilities and you have a lot of, and it also has the low level language performance that you need for systems programming. So uh, especially if you're doing something like a kernel or like really embedded software. And you're starting to see growing uh, use um, in industry. I mean, 
particularly among like the big like Amazons and Googles and whatnot. Google in particular has been doing a lot of projects um, in uh, in Rust, um, and it's uh, it's actually well supported in BSD. So if you want to start playing around with Rust and BSD, it's pretty easy to get up and going. And uh, I'm particularly interested in playing around with more getting more Rust components uh, on BSD. I think the Rust driver framework, I think, would be pretty fun to work on. So I'd like to sort of explore that some more. Um, so we'll see where I get. Um, and yeah, if anyone else is interested, I'd love to chat with you more about that. Um, so yeah, thanks. Anyone having a question? Uh, so, in, in Rust, they have the notion of unsafe, which you put yep. around a block where you can't really follow the rules. Yep. And as soon as you've done even one of those, a lot of the guarantees fall through. And all of any significant Rust that I've ever looked at has unsafe blocks in it. I and think, for example, it, calling any C function is an unsafe thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, like, uh, I think what you want to do is. Um, basically try to reduce the number of unsafe things that you have to do. I think there's a lot of code that you can write without using needing unsafe. Um, but if you do need unsafe, it's useful to have it if you're linking against C code. There are people who are looking at um, proving properties of the unsafe libraries and things like that. Um, so there's work going on there. But yeah, I mean, if you're doing really low-level system stuff, in some cases, you're probably going to have to do unsafe things, and they're working on ways to make that better. Um, but in some cases, the, uh, the unsafe things can be checked in other ways. Um, there's a group in uh, MPI who's looking at sort of verifying some of the unsafe portions in particular. But I think the value there is most of the code that you write is, uh, is safe. And then what you have to do is audit the unsafe portions, essentially. So it does reduce the, uh, the burden a bit. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I still think it buys you a fair amount. Sure. Uh, does Rust have the notion of shared libraries? Because in, in my experience in FreeBSD ports, uh, all dependencies, all crates are compiled into a big, basically static binary. And if, if, one, of the, if one of the dependencies has a vulnerability, it means that you have to recompile all Rust programs that use that one because it's bundled with them? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't, so you can build libraries. Um, I think typically you build statically. I'm not, I'm actually not sure. So the source files for Rust are .c files? Uh, .rs. .rs, but three slides ago, can you? Maybe yeah, there's a typo in the... Yeah, uh, here. So vi src. Oh yeah, that was my bad. It should be an rs. I'm just so used to like putting dot c, I guess. <laughs> okay, okay, I get it. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, actually, I, I meant I did mean to include a slide about that. There is a tool um, from Immunit that called C to Rust, and so it allows you to un, like factor semi-automatically for some features um, C to unsafe Rust, and they're creating a refactoring tool that converts. Uh, safe Rust or unsafe Rust to safe Rust, um, but it requires some a fair amount of manual intervention. But it's it's a pretty interesting tool. You're just checking that we're waiting for this dossier. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> my, I wasn't. <laughs> my major concern was that probably the syntax highlighters, you know, would be confused. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, you had a question about uh, the tier two things. I mean, what? we should do as a community to uh, move the FreeBSD support or uh, BSD uh, support in general to tier one? That's a good question. I think basically we probably need maybe some, commi some committers on like the Rust team basically. Um, so I think tier one, tier two basically means that like every commit that goes into the Rust uh, compiler essentially in like language uh, has to at least build. And tier one, you get some sort of guarantee. Basically, every commit that goes in actually passes CI. So probably there's some effort in like making sure that like the FreeBSD CI is like working or whatever BSD that you're working on, 
and uh, maybe also like getting some FreeBSD or BSD people as committers to like upstream Rust would probably help. But getting the CI sorted out is probably the first thing. And uh, I actually haven't looked at it, so I don't actually know what the status of like uh, the the FreeBSD CI or NetBSD CI is, because I think those are the only two that are probably running. But I think that would be a good first step at least. I'm just curious what language Rust is written in? I mean, is it built around client? Rust is mostly written in Rust, I think. Um, I think I think basically all Rust. Um, it uses LVM in the back end, so it does uh, have a C++ dependency. Rust, um, is Rust is written in Rust, and the first version was written in Ocon. Then it moved to Rust, so you need Rust to build Rust. Yeah. And Sorry, what was it written in? And it's one, one of the co Ocon? constant sources of uh, pain that Rust is written in Rust, and typically even in the last version of Rust, so bootstrapping is uh, a pain if you actually want to do it. More questions? Well, I have one uh, for operating systems. Uh, we typically have uh, fancy data structures like lists or trees that are self-referential, which don't go well with the ownership model of uh, Rust. How do the existing uh, attempts at uh, Rust and operating systems actually, actually deal with that? This is a good question. I think uh, basically they do the unsafe thing. Um, I think uh, there's more work to be done there. Um, there is, it is a challenge basically doing these sorts of like mutually owned kinds of data structures and doubly linked links and that kind of thing. Um, so there's more work to be done there. Um, I think there are patterns where you can do, basically create data, safe data structures um, in those scenarios, but it's, it's pretty challenging. Um, so there's more work to be done there. Any other questions? Have you considered the problem of when you rewrite the whole thing into Rust, you basically lose all of the history? Because most of the time when I'm digging through C files, I can track each line decades or even more back. So <coughs> with rewriting the whole thing, I will basically lose track of all the progress that was made on one thing throughout the systems. Was that considered? Uh, I mean, that's a fair, that's a fair concern, actually. Um, I mean, I guess, uh, so some of these tools where people are looking at uh, converting C to Rust, they're looking at uh, creating specifications and like basically verifying that the behavior is the same. So it doesn't really address your question of getting like a change log or anything like that or sort of losing the history. But um, if you want to create basically equivalent behavior, then that's one way to go. Uh, but yeah, I don't think it doesn't address your specific concern about uh, history. Okay, if those, those are all the questions, thank you very much. Thanks a lot.